Hello. So I want to talk to you about the sensory motor road to artificial intelligence. But first, we should know something about natural intelligence. And natural intelligence, to make sense of it, we should think of it in the light of evolution. So something like 540 million years ago, we had the first multicellular animals that could move about. And uh, moving was great, because that means that you could get to food in different places. But to get to food, you needed to know where the food is, which means meant you needed vision or some form of perception. And these two abilities go together. And there's this great line from Gibson, we see in order to move, and we move in order to see. And so if you think of the brain or the nervous system of a fly or a fish or a frog, it's basically this connection between perception, which could be vision, it could be hearing, to action. Uh, and action is moving about in this case. So if you zoom ahead to like five million years ago, which is the, when the first hominid split off from primates, you have this additional accomplishment, which is that we start to walk on two feet, which means that the hands are free to build tools, uh, make tools, uh, and, and then you get the advent of dexterous manipulation and planning and all the rest of it. And then the last big development is, of course, for modern humans, like 100,000 years ago or something, which is when we have language, which is uniquely human, and abstract thinking and symbolic behavior. But what's important to keep in mind is that most of the brain is devoted to perception and action and connecting the two. And if you think of the entire evolutionary history as being 24 hours of intelligence, language is in the last two or three minutes. That's all. It's very important, but it's only the last two and three minutes. And we, in this audience, I don't need to say much about language models, but it, they're incredible. And they can do the, I'll pick one line, they can pass the bar exam at 90th percentile. Incredible. So given such amazing accomplishments, what I want to connect you to is the fact that we have so much trouble on another side of AI, which is the robotic side of AI or self-driving cars. I have been in this field for 40 years. We have had self-driving cars for 30 years. Cars which drove across Europe from Berlin to Paris and across America and so on. And there's been a lot of hype about self-driving cars and we'll get them, we'll, we'll have the cars. But think of how hard it has been. And it's something which, so we can pass the, the, the law exam which takes years and something that a high school kid of 16 with after 20 hours of training is good enough at, we are having trouble with this. I can make this problem even harder. So think about what a 12-year-old kid can do, right? A 12-year-old kid in a kitchen with knives and forks and ladles and so forth can do all these kinds of tasks. And no robot today can do all of these tasks. Okay? This is incredible. Something easy we can't do. And this is something that people in AI have known for a long time. It's a paradox, right? A law exam, the bar exam, which takes years of study, is hard. And cooking an omelet is supposed to be easy. But actually, it's the other way around. Morwick had this great line, which is that things like chess are easy. Language is easy. What's hard is what a one-year-old can do. And uh, Steve Pinker has a beautiful line for this, which is that the hard problem, what we have learned from years of AI research is that the hard problems are easy and that the easy problems are hard. And, as the, and, and then he goes on to say that the gardeners, receptionists, and cooks are secure in their jobs for the years to come. And why? So the question is why? And Morovic's argument was to do with reverse engineering, and it was in the era of designing AI, and uh, there the question was, okay, what we have, what has emerged through hundreds of millions of years of evolution is much harder to sort of reverse engineer. I think actually the argument is slightly different. We know how AI has been achieved. It's largely been through uh, deep learning applied to huge amounts of data. And the kind of data we have, what's the kind of data we have? We have huge amounts of data for language models. Why? 
because everything is on the web, right? All the books are on the web. Wikipedia is on the web. Reddit for are on the web. GitHub is on the web. This enables you to train this, these models. So all this data is available explicitly. Think of what's the data needed for sensory motor training. You need to know what images I take and what are all my muscle commands and what are my neural activations. Hey, that's pretty personal. I'm not uploading that on the web. Okay? We are not going to get all that data in huge amounts on the web. We could get parts of it. We might see what the images are, but we are not going to get all of this. And therefore, we will need new clever ways of solving this problem. It will need AI, it will need learning, and I'm going to take you through a little bit of how we can do this. And I work a lot in robotics, and this is one of the robots that we trained in my group. And it's solving problems. Its foot was stuck against the rock, and it managed to go through. Uh, he, this robot, by the way, is blind. It has no vision. It's, okay? And you see it walking downstairs. It's not even aware of the stairs, but it manages to stabilize. Here's another example, which is on loose mud pile and uh, at a construction site. And so on and so forth. So you need a lot of versatility. So these problems are actually hard. And let me think of it more formally. Uh, computer vision is like pattern recognition. And we, the basic challenge is generalization. So we can't have a formal definition of a chair, but we can train a classifier for chairs by giving lots of examples. When we come to these motor control tasks, it's a different game. One part of it is handled by classical control theory, which is robustness to disturbances. You do feedback control. There's the second part, which is, which is actually the more interesting or harder part, which is that adaptation to these different conditions. So I showed you this setup where this robot dog has to walk in all these different terrains. So adaptation, that's very important. So we can use classical control theory uh, techniques to train uh, control controllers for particular situations. And for example, Boston Dynamics has a lot of work demonstrating these kinds of controllers. But where AI and machine learning can come in is can we build one policy to walk in all of these situations? One policy which figures out automatically which situation you are in, and then it walks in them. And this is a work from my group called Rapid Motor Adaptation, where we figured out essentially how to do this. And I'll just take you through the big idea. So the big idea is we train in, uh, this robot in simulation, and this base policy is like figuring out how to change all the joint angles and things like that. And there is this variable z, which you can see in that diagram. And this z captures some aspects of the terrain as some low dimensional vector. And uh, if we knew the z, we have this policy which will do different things. So it does different things in sand versus in hard ground and so on and so forth. OK. But we how do we do that in, in the real world? We need a way to estimate that itself. And for that, we sort of need to go meta. So we have an adaptation module, which, looking at the past history, figures out how to, uh, 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 what the z must be. So the intuition is something like this, that when I walk, if I walk on hard ground, I perform certain actions, and then there are consequences of those. If I do exactly the same thing when I'm on a beach, it's going to be different. Because when I put my foot down and I try to lift it up, it's not going to lift up so easily. And that kind of signal from the state and actions over the past one second or half a second, I have the signal. And, uh, and, and that's basically it. I mean, there are some details, obviously. But I'll show you an example here. So here is an experiment which uh, my uh, student Ashish did, where he's pouring olive oil and on this waste of good olive oil on a mattress. And then he's going to take the robot, and the, if you look at the legs of the robot, he's got like plastic socks to make it hard. And then he's going to make this robot walk. And what happens is that it, it starts to slip, right? Let's do it in slow-mo. 
So what's happening is that it has some estimate of the extrinsics, this z vector, and that estimate is wrong because it's slippery. Now what should happen is that over time, when it walks, it estimates this, and that's being done by this adaptation module, and once that estimate comes through, it works out, and then it's recovered. I'll give you another example. Now it's a much harder problem. I've got this robot, which has got uh, a vision system in it, and it's going to uh, walk in much more treacherous terrain. So now there's a camera, and it's, it ha everything is on board. It has no advanced knowledge of the terrain. And it's using similar techniques. Uh, notice that this robot is a very short robot compared to the heights of the stairs. And it's yet able to manage in these conditions. And it has no prior knowledge. And this is slippery ground as well as a slope. So, uh, and these ideas apply to other applications besides walking. Thank you, thank you. And uh, there's one which is a dexterous manipulation. So if I want to cook in a kitchen, I need to be able to manipulate with my multi-fingered hands. And here's an example of that. Similar idea, estimate what the situation is. The, so in this case, there are objects of different size, different shape, different weights. And, uh, and uh, I mean, that's what this says. And these are being estimated online. And uh, so for example, the shuttlecock is very light. It's only five grams, okay? And some of the objects are heavy, okay? Okay, there's this empty bottle, a Rubik's Cube. Very importantly, it's exactly the same policy. The robot is blind. It has no prior knowledge of what it is trying to control, but only from the proprioception, what it feels in the fingers, it is able to do the right thing. And I have more examples here. So, so I think that this is the future. I think we have to, machine learning and AI is essential for the success of robotics because we need flexibility and we need adaptation. But I want to conclude in the last two minutes that I have with some general philosophical remarks. So I entered the field of AI 40 years ago. For me, the success in the last five years is incredible. I would never have thought we would have get, got so far in the, what we did in the last five years, where we were five years ago versus now. And broadly speaking, deep learning in the last 10 years. But how do we do the rest? I think. Robotics is very important. Sensory motor control is very important. Without that, we have not achieved intelligence. There are these ideas for this which go back to Alan Turing. Alan Turing was like the father of computer science in a way. And he has this paper from 1950 which has the Turing test, but it has this great line. Instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child's? So it's essentially a program of learning, but learning with stages the way children learn. And we not know a lot from our psychologist colleagues about how children learn. Children uh, go through various stages of learning. There's this multimodal stage. This kid in the crib, she's playing around. She's t poking at objects. So uh, she hears, sees it. She hears the sound. She puts things in her mouth. Her motor system is being activated. All of that is training data. All of that is being used. The kid does experiments. So uh, uh, Alison Gopnik has this book called The Scientist in the Crib. So when this kid, when your toddler is being difficult and throwing food down, you should say she's actually a scientist in the crib. She's conducting an experiment from which she's building models of the world around us. And, and this is very important. And then finally, this ch child, at the age of two, you take them to the zoo, you give them one example of a zebra, it works. And our programs, we need to give them thousands of examples of zebras. And, uh, and then at the age of 16, we give them 20 hours of training, and then they can, they can drive, right? So 
we, I personally believe that this developmental story is going to be needed for all of AI. And the psychologists have actually told us what these steps are. Multimodal, incremental, physical, explore, be social, learn from others, and finally use language. So language is very important, but it is in a way the crowning achievement of intelligence, and it should be built on this substrate of physicality. Thank you very much for your attention.